Once upon a time, thousands of years ago, most of Ireland was covered by a thick blanket of forest. But as our ancestors populated and cultivated this land, practically all of these forests disappeared. Woodlands have always been at the heart of the Irish ecosystem, nurturing biodiversity and wildlife. But by 1900, only 1% 1 of our original forests remained. The loss of so much natural habitat was devastating, causing many species to become extinct. Today, many more species hang on the precipice. Since the 1950s, we've been planting conifer forests but these non-native species were prioritised as a timber resource rather than a wildlife habitat. We humans have always impacted on biodiversity, but in recent centuries our impact has intensified, to such an extent that we are in danger of undermining nature's most primary functions. We're ultimately threatening our own future. If we don't find a radical way to expand woodlands now, the natural balance of Ireland's ecosystem is in grave danger. Our ancient ancestors appreciated the woodlands. They were a spiritual people who lived in harmony with nature. Their monuments plotted the roots of stars and the passing of time. They saw magic and enchantment all around them, especially in trees. Yew, hazel, hawthorn and roan were considered to have magical properties. Our ancestors, would they have really enjoyed these woodlands? Well, they certainly had to survive in this kind of environment. Perhaps in the first couple of thousand years, when humans arrived here, they were very much confined to the coasts. There were forests covering most of Ireland, so they would have used the forests as sources of food, perhaps for berries, for fungi. I would think possibly they might have been a bit afraid of the forest. The forest had wolves, wild boar. It might have been kind of a dangerous place if you didn't know what you were doing. But there was probably also a mystical connection for people, a spiritual connection, and we can see that in the development of the Oum language. There are 20 symbols in the Oum alphabet, all of which are linked to different types of trees that were in the landscape at the time. There's an ancient Celtic connection with some trees, like yew trees. That's why we still see them in graveyards today. If you go to the National Museum of Ireland today, you'll see a magnificent canoe. It's about 15 metres long and it was found in a bog in Galway. It was made from one single oak tree, about a metre wide and 15 metres long. 15 metres is about the height of one of these oak trees now. So it was a massive canoe. But in order to build a canoe of that size, the tree was much bigger. So we had oak trees of that width and twice the height of these trees now. Wow. We had forests that size. It was probably like a jungle. The native forests were so important to the ancient Irish that even the Brehan laws had specific clauses dealing with trees. The penalty for cutting down an elm tree or a birch would cost you one cow. But God help you if you cut down an oak tree. That would set you back two and a half cows. Very expensive when you consider that a physical assault on another person would only cost you two cows. Despite the damage we've done, forests are still special places for us. They excite our souls. But they have even greater value to the flora and fauna. Just like the Amazonian rainforest, a delicate ecosystem is at play here, something scientist John Cross understands well. These sort of woodlands are confined in Europe to Western Ireland and Western Britain. So they're very rare on an international basis. This woodland is an old oak woodland, what we call an Atlantic oak woodland, and it's dominated by oak, sessile oak, which is the principal canopy forming tree which you see above us. 
mixed in with that is a certain amount of birch and ash. And then below that we have the, the shrub layer, which is formed by lower growing trees like holly, a certain amount of willow and hazel on more fertile soils. Then below that again we have the herbaceous layer, the herb layer, which is formed from things like wood rush, the ferns and bramble. And then we have another layer below that again, uh, formed from mosses uh, like these here, mosses and liverworts. They're all interdependent on one another. This is the important thing. And they represent the sort of vegetation which covered much of Ireland before man started to clear the forests. And they provide habitat for a very large number of organisms, plants and animals. Our native woodlands play host to an incredible wealth of wildlife. Anya Murray of Birdwatch Ireland offered to meet me on the shores of Loch Derevara in West Meath to give me a sense of exactly how critical these habitats are. Well, the, the main stand of species here is Scots pine. So things like hawthorn and holly and mountain ash, they've got a lot of berries in the autumn. And they provide food for an awful lot of different birds and mammals, woodland mammals like mice and badgers and voles and seed-eating birds and fruit-eating birds. You get flocks of siskin and redpole would come in in the autumn and they would clear some of these berries if you get a whole flock of them coming in in the autumn months. The trees themselves provide food source for the whole ecosystem here, but it's also all the small plants that are adapted to live on the woodland floor. And then we've got the leaf litter and we have a whole load of different invertebrates would break down that leaf litter like millipedes and, and things like that, and worms. And then birds would come and eat all of those invertebrates as well. Uh, so this is, it's not just the trees, it's everything that comes from the trees and all the nutrients that nourish the soil. So little creatures running along the bark here. Yeah, you'd have all sorts of invertebrates in here. Oh, look, here's a little snail. Look at this fella. Gorgeous, that was hiding in the crevice there of the bark. Mm. There's a wood lice here as well, I just spotted. It's really important for biodiversity. There's a whole range of wildlife that depend on native woodlands, uh, and we need more of them. At the moment, there's little patches here and there. They tend to be the ones that didn't get felled, like on, on really steep slopes, where it was just inaccessible for clearance, uh, or in remote places. And it's very difficult for a lot of species to travel from one woodland patch to another, because they're specially adapted to this kind of environment, this kind of sheltered woodland environment. So they won't travel across open farmland. So if we have more woods in the landscape, even if they're, they're connected up as much as possible, we'll allow wildlife to disperse and move throughout the landscape and hopefully improve some of the population levels. It would be wonderful to start getting that back again. As custodians and guardians of the Irish landscape, farmers and landowners will be essential to getting more native woodland growing around the country. As an incentive, a funding scheme has been put in place for those who want to plant woodlands of native species. The Native Woodland Scheme is run by the Forest Service and it's basically aimed at providing landowners funding to develop new native woodland in the Irish countryside. The native woodlands can basically go anywhere in the countryside, but ideally where they can maximise all the different environmental benefits that you can get from having a native woodland. For example, along watercourses where they can protect the water quality, in scenic areas where they can be very complementary in terms of the landscape, and also in a lot of environmental sensitive areas where native woodland could be compatible with the very sensitivities in those landscapes. I think it's very much for individual farmers themselves to weigh up the pros and cons, but what the Native Woodland Scheme provides is grant and premiums for a number of years, and also at the end of it, a woodland resource which the farmer then can manage um, in the long term for, for quality wood production.
there are lots of responsibilities that landowners and farmers are facing in terms of environmental issues, environmental protection. And here's a scheme that delivers a whole range of different ecosystem benefits in terms of water quality, biodiversity, linking habitats, carbon, uh, landscaping and all these other issues. So it's, it's really a win-win in terms of what the farmers get and also what the environment gains. Under the Native Woodland Scheme, in certain circumstances, sensitive areas for protecting water quality and SACs can be compatible for support funding. The grant covers all the costs of fencing and planting, plus a premium for 20 years. Well, we can see the value of expanding and connecting our native fragmented woodlands, but where are we going to find the land? There's always pressure on land. Well, one place to look would be along the banks of our rivers. If we were to plant native woodlands all along our rivers from source to sea, there would be multiple benefits by doing so. In Delphi, North Connemara, a fascinating project is underway. Sitting on the border between Mayo and Galway, Delphi Lodge is one of the most hospitable historic guest houses in the country. England's Prince Charles is among those who have stayed here. Delphi Lodge is also a working farm with 300 acres, most of it grazed by sheep. Naturally, in a place like this, the manager, Michael Wade, is deeply conscious of the environment. The land we drive through was once covered in native woodland. Michael brings me to a small river where the damage caused by the loss of trees is all too visible. Here we have a classic example of where the river, the power of the water, particularly in high water and floods, is undermining the bank. You can see it is quite loose. And this is happening mainly because the vegetation has changed over hundreds of years and the, the stability that the trees give the soil, the root structure obviously stabilises the banks, is, is no longer here. These trees are no longer here in this particular area. And as a result, the river is encroaching, it's been moving this direction. So all of this area here was, the river was over here? Absolutely, the river was the 30, 40 metres over there and in recent decades it is coming this direction and undermining the bank, causing soil erosion. Well, these rivers are key rivers. These are spawning grounds for salmon and sea trout. And obviously, when the, when the soil is eroded and falls in, it, it brings in silt into the system, which interferes with the gravel structure, which is all important for the fish. We travel further into the valley to see what Delphi Lodge is doing to halt the soil erosion. In 50 acres, they've planted 60,000 native tree saplings. So some nice little trees here. These are all yeah. plantings, all planted last Exactly, year. they've all been actually all been planted this year, Duncan. We've taken sheep out of this area and already in a relatively short space of time, you can see where the headers have re-established themselves. We have a denser vegetation which is stabilizing the banks. And of course, as our trees come on, these native species, the root structure will help stabilize this fragile environment and ultimately cut down on erosion. Visually, it'll enhance for our tourists and our local community. And by the way, I think it's important to say that, yes, okay, Delphi Lodge tourism is our main business, but we're also a farmer. And like other farmers in this area, our neighbors in these hills, you know, we have to make money out of farming. We have to make money out of our land. And where we've planted all these species, the native woodland scheme, sure we've lost a little bit of land that we had sheep on, We've got premium from this planting. For 20 years, for yeah. For 20 years, which for the amount of land involved far exceeds the income we, we would have got out of sheep in that area. Great. Great, That's it. great story for other farmers too, well, isn't it? You know, it's, it's the way forward and farming, people have to make an income from the land and there has to be a way forward, yeah. even in hard cash yeah. terms. If more farmers do what Michael is doing, they will not only increase our native woodland, but they will also protect our rivers. Small rivers and streams are nurseries for salmon and trout. 50% of all the food they eat comes from terrestrial insects falling from trees. 
More trees equals more insects equals more fish. While many of our water courses have been polluted, some parts of the country, particularly remote parts of Galway and Mayo, are still pristine. Martin McGarrigal takes me to a secret location to see a river that's so clean that it's home to one of the world's most elusive creatures, the freshwater pearl mussel. And, and you'll see their mouth, will you? Is that what you look out for? Yeah, yeah, you're seeing the, the siphon, the filter. And I see some. There's, there's look, some quite clear there. ones there, yeah. Yeah. More down here. Look, there's a whole group of them here. Wow. This will give you a clear view through the, the glare. Great. Thank you. Now, these are adults. These are quite big, and they're, they're probably 50 to 100 years, or maybe even older. 50 to 100 years old? Yeah. And, and, the and problem, how old will they grow to? Oh, they can hit 150 anyway. I, I mean, this. I can see you this hear, one here. You now. hear 200. I, I'm not, I don't know, but. But the, that's not where the problem is. The problem is at the other end of the life cycle. They're not reproducing properly. They have this very complicated life cycle, first of all. They start off on the gills of trout or salmon. Really? As parasites. They live there for a while and then they drop off as a tiny little um, pearl mussel. And it needs five years about of clean gravel to get to the stage where you can see them above, you know, before they're a few centimetres. Right, so they're really small at that stage. They're tiny, yeah. And this is, this is why they're not surviving. Like, most populations haven't reproduced for 50 years properly. Um, so that, that's, they're, they're obviously going to die out. Even though they're long-lived, they're going to die out eventually. This endangered species still survives in some isolated rivers, but in most cases, they've stopped reproducing. If we don't protect our rivers, the freshwater pearl mussel will become extinct. Ireland's rivers are the arteries, the blood vessels of the natural world. I'm excited by the idea that a balanced strategy of planting, one that is compatible with other ecosystems, can create new corridors for wildlife. I travel to Brackloon Wood in northwest Mayo to see what tree expert Declan Little thinks. Isn't that just magnificent? Look at that. It's just absolutely magical, isn't it? Yeah. It's like a wonder world, yeah. a fairy world. It's like stepping back in time. So Duncan, this is a good example of what we call ancient woodland. It's been here for at least 350, 400 years. But in fact, we know from research that there was probably woodland continuity here going back about eight to 9,000 years since the opening of the, since the end of the last ice age. So if farmers did plant trees like this along the rivers, is this what it would turn out like? Well, if you look in time's eye 300 years ahead, why not? Uh, if you have a reservoir of old woodland nearby that all these grown flora and ferns, mosses and so on can spread into it, this is what you would uh, get in maybe 300, 400 years time. Uh, this takes a long time to develop. It's very complex in terms of both the flora and the fauna. So for this to develop, you really are talking about long periods of time, hundreds of years. So why would we bother? Well, if you think of it, there are multiple ecosystem services that can be derived from doing this. One, we're protecting water quality. Secondly, it's a flood mitigation measure because when the river floods, the woodland acts like a trap and slows the flow of the water. And three, there's also carbon sequestration. These are permanent woodlands, so they're going to lock up carbon and keep, them here, keep that carbon here permanently. And of course, then there's the biodiversity. These are basically corridors in the landscape. They connect woodlands with each other. So if you've got uh, woodland along the rivers, they connect one area of woodland with another, and you've got basically avenues for flora and fauna to travel along. Ireland has 70,000 kilometers of rivers. Imagine what a difference it would make to our wildlife and biodiversity if we planted suitable stretches of riverine areas with native trees. The big question is whether we could really produce enough saplings to plant on this scale. A fascinating and valuable project managed by Quilcher suggests we could. Teams have been gathering native seeds from some of Ireland's finest trees and bringing them to collection centres and tree nurseries like this one in Ballon Temple, County Carlow. It's all carefully managed. Every seed can be traced to its source. 
The lads were out collecting acorns, they get them into us and we got to get them on the floor straight away and get them surface dry. So we applied to the Forest Service for permission to collect. But everything that comes into us has to be completely traceable. So we give it a unique identity number. Traceability is critically important. Absolutely. Quilcher are collecting quality selected seeds of every Irish native species and planting them out in vast nursery plantations. This is a two-year-old crop of uh, native Irish oak, peduncled oak. This is a massive amount of oaks. How many oaks in this area? Yeah, in, in, in two fields here we have uh, three quarters of a million. Three quarters of a million oak, oak trees? Yes, wow. for, for the Irish market. Really? These have all been grown from the seed that we have collected. Monica prepared them in the seed store. We have approximately four million broadleaf trees, which is uh, 15 to 20 percent of what we grow in, in quilchia nurseries. Very good. And these mostly native species too, are well, they? Absolutely. 95% would be native species. Really good. Yeah. Could we expand all our native woodlands now with these sort of trees here around the country? Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. So clearly sourcing the trees to replant Ireland's native forests is possible. All that's needed is for farmers to take advantage of the native woodland scheme. For inspiration, I'm visiting Thomas Packenham, founder of the Irish Tree Society. Thomas's ancestors have nurtured native trees at the Tullinelli Castle estate in Westmead for centuries. We scrambled through some old growth forest to see a baby oak woodland, which Thomas planted 13 years ago. Well, this is the Millennium Wood. You're, you're, you're here. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed when I look at the height of some of them that they must be nearly 25, even 30 feet, and yet they're only 12 years since they were an acorn. I would say this one here is going to be the winner in the Darwinian struggle. In other words, there's only going to be room for one tree where we're standing, and at the moment we've thinned out about 10, and then this will be a huge tree. We leave the fledgling forest and walk to the castle grounds, again, where it? Thomas introduces me to the original trees from whose acorns much of the Millennium Forest was spawned. These massive, ancient, noble oaks are a sight to behold. Well, we call this the Tallinnale elite group, and they've been uh, distributed, the acorns from them, all, all over Ireland as a sort of pedigree stock. For the Millennium Forest, we collected from all these, there were then 11. So the elite oaks, this group of 11. Who would have planted them? Well, if, if I take uh, father, grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather, great great grandfather, great great great, it's great 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 great, four greats, great, 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 great. 1745. That's, wow. that's when we believe that was planted. They were really looking into the future, weren't they? I think country gentlemen did plant trees in their parks to make their parks beautiful, knowing that when they died, their grandchildren or great-grandchildren would get some money from the sale, because oaks were always very valuable trees. There was always a commercial element. It wasn't just a vision of a, 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 a delightful scene. It, 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 money came into it, and it's still true. This tree has been watching your family, watching over yeah. your family. I know, for I 10 know. For 250 years, yes. to well, do you think, six generations. Yes, What's their, what would their comments be, do you think? Uh, laughing, mocking us, do you think? Or do you yeah, think they're, they're... Observing us, anyway. They must benevolently, think or, or...? I hope so. They you... must wonder what us humans are, of course, <laughs> you know, because they go back millions of years. Yeah. 250 years ago, Thomas Packenham's ancestors had the vision to recognise the value of planting native species. It was their gift to the future, a gift that is bearing fruit today. I believe we're at the cusp of reawakening an ecological vision. By increasing native woodlands across the country and along a river banks, it could bring massive benefits to our ecosystems, to wildlife, to our own health, that will make the effort well worthwhile. Well, I can't pretend that this will be easy, but with a little vision, consensus and determination. We could have woodlands like this interlinked across the country. They'd be wonderful for ecosystems, for wildlife and for us. I already feel the blood of our ancestors rising. <laughs>